then readers can subscribe monthly and support you at these various levels that you choose to set up. And then as a platform, we're free to use, free to free to publish on, but we take a 10% fee plus payment processing of what you make in a platform. So writers usually take home about 85% of, of what they make on Ream. So that's like the full business model and picture of Ream. And when readers are on Ream, the key is that there's two aspects to the reading experience, which is that you have a all the stories on Ream, which is a social e-reader, is what we call it, where readers can comment on every paragraph and give feedback to the author, communicate with each other. So it's a very immersive, community-oriented experience. And then there's a CUNY section to Ream where authors can make updates, almost like a Facebook social media type of area. And readers will get all these updates through email. And you get to choose which readers see it. Do I want it to be available to everyone? Just my pay tiers, my follow tiers. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 321 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have a conversation with steamy romance author Amelia Rose and science fiction author Michael Evans. Now, Amelia and Michael are two of the three co-founders of Ream, a subscription platform by fiction authors for fiction authors. But it's not just for fiction authors, because you're going to hear there's some inventive and amazing ways that authors have been leveraging Ream as both a subscription service and a platform to engage with their readers. And that's coming up later in this podcast. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is an audiobook platform that allows you to get your audiobook out into that global world. Yes, the world is global and it's round. I'm taking a stand. The world is round, not flat. But because it's round and it's beautiful and there's so many amazing things out there, you have choices and options. And Find A Way Voices gives you those choices and options. You can find a professional narrator. There's thousands of professional narrators available through Voices Marketplace. And you can sample them, check them out, and see if they're perfect for your audiobook. Or... If you already have uh, audiobook files ready to go, you can leverage Findaway Voices for distribution. The choice, the options, the globe is yours with Findaway Voices. Basically, it's a great platform for wanting to take control of your audiobooks. You can set your own prices. You can run promotions through Findaway Voices. There's lots of choices, lots of control, and lots of options. And if you want to see how you can leverage these options, you can do it over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. There, there was nothing flat about what I just said, was there? Yeah, no, it's okay. It worked out well. Yeah, okay. I was just, just goofing around with the two different voices at the end because, you know, why not make the ad read just a little bit less than you know, just vanilla? Not that there's anything wrong with vanilla. I love vanilla. It's, 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 it's a fantastic flavor when done right. But you know what I mean. Like, you know, Kind of plain without, you know, with uh, much uh, excitement or, or thrill or, or dynamics to it. Dynamics. Is that a word? Anyways, I'm just rambling and trying to find my way back to the comments. Yeah, comments. Let's get into comments from recent episodes. So I do want to say a huge thank you to everyone who shared and reshared links to my guest appearance in episode 200 of uh, the Indie Author Podcast with Maddie Dalrymple. And and a lot of these links were shared over on the platform formerly known as Twitter. They tweeted it to the X platform, or however you say that nowadays. 
I don't think they they X'd it is, is really a good thing to say. But I just want to say thank you guys so much for sharing comments and resharing that. Um, Maddie and I had a great time chatting. We talked about how times have changed or in many ways stayed the same since Maddie first launched her podcast, the Indie Author Podcast, uh, several years ago. So it was a fantastic it was a fantastic conversation. I love what Maddie did with it uh, as well. So she shows the video. She does the audio, obviously, for the podcast feed. But then she takes these really cool sampler clips. Yeah, I usually have a sampler clip that I play at the beginning of the episodes, uh, you know, with the with the theme music for the podcast. And I often will incorporate either that teaser or uh, another teaser into um, using headliner.app to create sort of a short visual uh, resharable, you know, 30 second, one minute sort of clip that I can share on social media, but nowhere near as, as great as the way uh, Maddie does it. So something for me to strive for, but, um, so just a thank you to everyone who shared those comments. And then of course, over on starkreflections.ca for episode 320, Edwin Downward said, once again, I have a comment that won't fit into a tweet, an X. See, that's the thing, right? It's like, never, I'm not, let's not go there. <laughs> Back to Edwin's comment. The Venn diagram between diversity of IP has me revisiting the question of audiobook editions of my novels. I've made a point of saying my stories are not related to a planet called Earth or its primary English language societies. To this end, I've often thought it would be fun to find a narrator with an accent from outside the English language bubble. Except such a move runs a large risk of repelling listeners from that same market. The AI option aside, it's a good thing I'm a long way from being able to pull off such a move within my IP. And and I, I know you were, it's an interesting comment, Edwin, because it's almost, you recognize the value and the uniqueness of it, but you also worry about it being too far from the market. But it's just so interesting because sometimes, sometimes there's things we want to do, but we're not ready, you know, finances, resources, time, whatever it is that prevents us from getting there but sometimes those things that prevent us from getting there may give us the space that we may need to come up with a plan like maybe there is a, a plan or a way to incorporate both of those elements in such a way and I don't know you're you're a creative dude uh, but in such a way that you know neither one of us can see now but maybe comes clear in the near future I'm, 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 a, I'm a strong believer in that right timing that often happens for us. So just a quick question. Can you hear the cars going by outside? Uh, I normally close the window when I'm recording that. So if you're hearing cars going by outside, oh, well, sorry. This gives you a little bit of ambient noise. Oh, good, great. Um, a lawnmower too. Oh, yay. All the fun s sounds from the background. <laughs> but uh, so I want to say thank you to Edwin and thank you to everyone who leaves comments either over on the Twitter slash X sphere or on, on, the, um, um, on, the, on, the, on the, the website starkreflections.ca and that comment from edwin came from episode 320 maximizing your creative ip with renita hora and uh great thank you guys for leaving your comments i do love sharing those comments i love hearing what you're thinking and what you're reflecting on when you're listening to the podcast but that's it uh, for the comments just in terms of a brief personal notes as mentioned, I'm, I'm finally back and slowly playing catch up on all the things that I have to do. Now, one of the catch 22s that I found myself in, and, and, and my best friend from Ottawa was in town uh, for a few days earlier this week. So I kind of rearranged and scheduled all the work that I did like in the early morning while everyone was sleeping. So, so I could hang out with him uh, in the afternoons and the evenings. And at one point, uh, I got a text message from uh, an author that I'm working with, and I actually turned to him and I said, oh, wow, okay, I just got two different manuscripts from two different people today because because the timing changed on one of them. And, uh, well, actually, the timing changed on both of them, let's be honest, because things were, were, were kind of fluid. But, uh, you know, I originally had, okay, this is going to come in around this time and I'll work on it. And this is going to come in on that time. It's going to work on it. Well, they both came out at a different time, but it was the exact same time. And I just turned to him and said, I did not want to be a publisher. Um, and, and I was saying it sort of jokingly, but I mean, I found myself in a situation right now where just in the next uh, few months, I'm going to be releasing three different books. 
that are um, uh, books I love and I think they're amazing, but I'm recognizing that I've suddenly turned Stark Publishing into a publisher and yet I don't take submissions. These are, these are projects I actually love and want to do and want to get out into the world, but they're not my books. And this is the catch-22 that I find myself in, in terms of, I love the work that I do helping other authors. And I love, and I love that I'm publishing these books, but I have to recognize this is time I don't have. And I'm currently struggling with how to get some of the time back for my own writing because there's some projects um, in in between the books. There's some other writing projects that I'm really uh, eager to dip my toes in. And I have started to dip my toes in, but I've had to take a step back because I'm taking the master's program and because I'm still doing work with draft to digital and I still have clients that I'm uh, helping out. I'm probably going to have to scale back on on when I offer the free 20 minute sessions. I do offer free 20 minute chats with anyone who wants to talk to me. And I want to be able to do that because I want to be able to give to the author community, but I'm probably gonna have to scale back on what days I do them only because I it ends up filling up my time. And I know it, it's, it seems it's only like a 20 minute meeting, but it always takes me more than 20 minutes, right? Because I have to you know block the time, I have to get ready, I have to prep it. I do offer to record it for the author, which means I have to take the additional time. And often I will send them additional links and information after the session. So that 20-minute that free session usually ends up costing me an hour. I'm not saying I want to charge. I do charge uh, for a full hour, um, a full hour long, but it's, it's, it's hard uh, to balance. So I'm, I'm just sort of talking through this aloud uh, to share it with you on the fact that I am not going to not offer these because I think it's really important to offer that free consultation with folks. But I'm probably going to have to reduce because uh, I have an automated calendar through Calendly where I set up when I can do these. I'm probably going to have to reduce. And, and I stretch the times that I make it available for people in different work situations and in different parts of the world. So it's somewhat convenient for the person uh, trying to reach out to me, not always just convenient for me. But I'm probably going to have to limit that, uh, limit what days I, I accept those meetings on uh, in order to make sure that I can buffer uh, the extra time that I need to, to make sure that my own writing doesn't fall behind. So uh, again, I hope that reflection is somewhat useful for you if you're struggling with time. And again, it's not that I don't want to do all the things. I really want to do all those things, but I'm also recognizing just how stressed it you know that kind of stuff has made me over the last little while and just and 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 that it doesn't seem to be going away so something's got to give and uh and and I I want to not get to the point where it where it gives uh, because you know when when my buddy Steve was here in town it was really great I actually for several hours in a row several hours in a row I actually chilled and we just Liz and Steve and I sat around and had some drinks and laughed and listened to music and chatted and, 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 you know, did all the things. And, and I just recognized how valuable and important doing that was because normally I don't really break for that long. I'm usually breaking up. Okay. We're going to eat and I'm going to go back to work and then we're going to do this and we're going to go back to work and we're going to relax for an hour and I'm going to go back to work and stuff like that. And again, I love my work and I think that's one of the challenges. I love it so much. I love what I do that I'm constantly doing it. So again, rambling, rambling, rambling. I think, I think I should stop the rambling. And I think what I should do is introduce uh, Michael and Amelia so we can get into the wonderful conversation, find out about them and their writing, but also about this really great platform, Rain, that was just launched in the spring of 2023. And that's coming up right after this bumper. Michael, Amelia, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we're going to be talking about a number of things here, but before we uh, get into those topics, I first want uh, introduction, and I, I guess I should have given you forewarning, Amelia, that, you know, ladies first, I want to hear your backgrounds as creative people and as writers, um, just to share so that my listeners can be familiar with you. So Amelia, who is Amelia and how did she get into writing? Um, so I started writing when I was in high school, and I was reading a lot on a serial f- fiction platform called Wattpad. Okay. Um, and so I started writing there, and I took a took a bit of a break when I got to college. But then I really needed something to just, you know, just like for myself. And so I started writing again, and one of my books became very popular on the platform. And my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, was like, "You should publish it." And I was like, oh, no thanks. Like, I don't, I don't want people to have to pay for my work. I felt so awkward and didn't have confidence in myself. Really? Yeah. After was, all of that feedback from people in the Wattpad community. Yeah, and I was, I was like, no, we're, we're not letting anyone pay for it. But anyway, he convinced me to start a subscription and started a subscription where people can see kind of early access, so they didn't have to pay, but okay. if they wanted to, they could. Um, and that kind of blew up after a while and we started publishing so that is my very short and I also write steamy romance steamy romance okay um now I was kind of curious did you were you drawn to Wattpad as a writer or a reader first reader okay. yeah I was like super into reading all the werewolf romance stories on there because I couldn't find them anywhere else okay all right it's awesome <laughs> how about you Michael how, what's the what's Michael's writer origin story yeah, I mean, similar to Amelia, got started in high school with my publishing journey and also probably very similar to Amelia, I did not imagine myself actually publishing books when I started writing. Yeah. I just was very, very dedicated to this one specific dystopian world I, I was creating. I'm a sci-fi thriller author and I just, it just turned into a, a, a something that became a book and I was like, oh my God, wow. And then I wrote a second one and then that's when I started to realize maybe like one, this is what I want to do with my life. Like I want to tell stories and then two, like maybe I can get it published. And that's when I discovered the world of any publishing through folks like Mark Dawson and Joanna Pan listening to their podcast. And I was like, oh, wow, this is doable. So I saved up money at a summer job. I was a pool tenant at a resort. I live in Charleston, South Carolina. So it's, it's, it was a fun, it was a fun job, but put all of that money into publishing the first book, you know, editor, cover, um, designer, all that stuff. And I got hooked on it. I loved it. I loved this industry. I loved the CUNY and took a gap year between high school and college. And by the time I went to college, I'd published 12 books. And from there, really well, got into By the into time YouTube. you went to college, you published 12 books? Yes. It was all like in three different series, sci-fi thrillers. Wow. Okay. I, I was super into it. And then, and, I, and then I got like obsessed with YouTube and obsessed with live streaming. <laughs> and then that led me down the route of like getting super interested in the creator economy, different startups and technologies. And then that's how I met Amelia because I was really determined to like work in the space of helping build a technology platform, fiction authors. I didn't even quite know what I wanted to be besides the fact that I had this vision for the future in the creator economy and publishing. But when I met Amelia and saw that she was doing like really well with subscriptions and that she had the success, I was like, okay, that's super inspiring. And then Amelia was telling me, I don't want to steal your part of the story, but Amelia was telling me about some of the problems she had with another platform. But regardless, that's how me and Amelia met. I don't necessarily want to go to that story and wow. jump the gun on that. But me and Amelia met through this whole adventure and we've had a great time working together now for like 16 or 17 months. So, yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. I, I, now I'm curious about the parallel storylines, right? So Amelia's reading and writing on Wattpad, sort of serialized platform where, and then evolved into, you know, I'm going to just, whatever, have my own platform or my own way to get this to people via subscription for free, or if they want to pay, great. So you're experimenting with that. And then Michael, we're, we're publishing novels, you know, indie publishing novels, but you mentioned YouTube and, and that sort of fascination with, because YouTube is very serialized when you think about it right it's it's, it's not yeah. one thing like a book it's a thing people return to with a subscription so how did how did you guys how did you guys meet was it at a conference was it online if you do it tell michael <laughs> okay i it's definitely <laughs> our story but okay. basically amelia had the parallel storylines here so amelia was 
work. She had been recruited by like this upcoming serial fiction uh, platform. It was a new startup, and mm-hmm. I'm sure you know this, Mark. But there's a lot of startups in the serial fiction space, specifically, and a lot of them are um, maybe onerous contract terms. We won't we won't even go into those details. But no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it, it's bad. I, yeah. But Amelia was obviously trying to you know be an author who was helping out and, and insert a, a, a great voice into the future of that that platform, right. and. I had found those guys through an article that L Griffin wrote um, because I was a big follower of L Griffin. And I had been contacting a bunch of startups, basically asking them like, Hey, what are you doing? I like book club startups, all these different things. I was just obsessed with like, I had felt that. And, you know, no one path in particular is best for everyone in self-publishing, but I felt that I wanted to build a home for my readers directly sell to them, do a lot of the stuff that I saw YouTubers doing and saw live streamers doing. And when I was contacting these startups, I contacted the one that Al Griffin uh, had mentioned in her article. And, you know, Amelia was one of the authors there. And when we ended up meeting, uh, I think we just learned that they were maybe outside of the industry um, and that although maybe they had good intentions, uh, we should be working together and we should be the ones doing it. And then Amelia was telling me about how Patreon, which was the platform that she was monetizing her early access on, right. was just not suited for her as a writer and was censoring her work, was taking her tons of time to manage. And she was having a lot of readers unsubscribe because it wasn't a great experience for them to actually read her stories in the platform. And then that's oh, yeah, when I was like, right. yeah. hmm, this feels like a great place to start. But obviously there was a third parallel story in all of this, which is Sean. He's our third co-founder. He's a team of three of us. So Sean is Amelia's husband, as she mentioned, but he is a software engineer and he's been uh, building stuff for well over a decade. He's very, very talented. And I was like, oh, I think we, we've got it here. And he was already building a form of like a subscription, like on Amelia's like own website. And that's when we all kind of came together and we're like, you know what? why don't we just make a platform that can do this for everyone? Um, as we like to say, the subscription platform by fiction authors for fiction authors. So that's like the genesis of it. So um, you were building this platform for writers, but I don't think we've mentioned what it's called yet. What 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 is this platform called? And is it available yet? It is. It is available. Uh, it's called Ream. Uh, Reamstories.com is the website, but Ream is the name, like, like a ream of paper. Paper, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's available so how does how does ream work then so you you wanted to do these things for your own writing because you know amelia was already doing that and obviously patreon was substandard for the reading experience right mm-hmm. so you built this platform ream and then made it available does that mean other writers who are interested can sign up and leverage this platform yes yeah, anyone can um, sign up, no matter if you're a new writer or an experienced writer who's been publishing for a while. Um, it's completely open now. We were in beta for a, a couple months in the beginning right. of the year, but yeah, anyone can sign up at the moment and check it out. Yeah. So, how does it work? How does it let's, for, for, let's start from the from the writer perspective. How how does that work? I'd say there's two main components, Serene, and. One of them I'm going to give you a first look at because we're developing a lot of stuff in real time. And this thing's coming out <laughs> very soon. So probably by the time this airs, it'll be true. But Ream's okay. a, a membership platform in the sense that we want to help readers be members of your world and support you okay. monthly, um, support you usually through money, but it doesn't have to be. So there's two components to Ream, the free membership aspect and the paid membership aspect. So mm-hmm. the free membership aspect is where an author could publish you know, either serialized or a full book on it. It depends how they want to release it. We have a very advanced scheduler that if they are doing serial fiction, makes their life very easy. And if they're not, then it's just, you know, publish a book. It all comes out at once. Mm -hmm. But authors can choose to make their book free on Ream, which you can do on a bunch of other platforms. You can do on your own website. But the key thing about being a free member is that you as an author can actually get the reader's email so that you can gate of chapter as follower only. And when someone follows you, they're basically signing up for your mailing list to receive further updates from you. So it's like a direct selling for free reading discovery aspect of the free membership. So that's really key for authors who like, well, every author, because every author is going to have people who don't want to be part of their paid membership, but still want to stay in touch with them. Right. But especially authors who are like, just getting started, you know, who are like, I want a place to go to put my work 
but I don't want to have exclusivity agreements. We don't have any. Um, I don't want to have any like onerous contract terms. We don't have that. We're just a direct selling platform for you to connect directly to the readers. So then right. the second okay. piece, and this is where we really started and what you know we really want to build providers, which is a place for them to get paid subscription income where each month they can make recurring revenue from their super fans. And that's the paid membership aspect. And authors can choose to gate content as only for paid tiers. Okay. And then that's when you can say, you choose your price. Maybe it's $5 a month, maybe it's $10 a month. Maybe you have different tiers at different dollar amounts. And we can go into all those different strategies, but readers then will pay monthly to get access to maybe your stories that you're publishing, maybe bonus content. You might have things like extra scenes that weren't in the regular book or character right. profiles, world maps. You might have monthly Zoom calls, book boxes. We've seen it all. And then readers can subscribe monthly and support you at these various levels that you choose to set up. And then as a platform, we're free to use, free to free to publish on, but we take a 10% fee plus payment processing of what you make in a platform. So writers usually take home about 85% uh, of what they make on Ream. So that's like the full business model and picture of Ream. And when readers are on Ream, the key is that there's two aspects to the reading experience, which is that you have a all the stories on Ream, which is a social e-reader, that's what we call it, where readers can comment on every paragraph and give feedback to the author, communicate with each other. So it's a very immersive, community-oriented experience. And then there's a CUNY section to Ream where authors can make updates, almost like a Facebook social media type of area right, right, and yeah. readers will get all these updates through email and you get to choose which readers see it do i want it to be available to everyone just my paid tiers my follow tiers and to be clear i don't know when this is airing but follow tiers will be fully rolled out within the next 30 days so this is something that's coming it'll that probably aspect. be live by the time you're listening to this dear listener <laughs> probably paid tiers are completely live so that that's okay. the first thing we launched right. we wanted to help authors start generating some subscription income in the platform and then we were like right. oh Everyone wants to also bring their other readers here who might not be ready to be paid members. So that's right. why that's our next big feature launch. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it feels like you're taking some of the, uh, some of the stuff I remember loving the best about Wattpad is that interaction with readers and the commenting and stuff. So it feels like you've taken the best of all these various platforms and oh. them all in one. <laughs> That was um, when we were originally designing it. I was like, I love certain things about all these different platforms, but there are other aspects of it that I hate. So we're just going to grab everything that I love and I that I know works and we're right. going to match it all together and make a really awesome platform for authors. So I'm having these uh, as a writer myself, of course, I'm, have, I'm imagining uh, Sean's your husband, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm imagining the, the two of you together with Sean hopped up on caffeine and sugar, probably because that's how we get as writers. And Sean with either a whiteboard or something, drawing and mapping out, trying to incorporate all the different things you wanted and then going, okay, slow down. <laughs> That's actually so accurate. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you wanted it. it all at once, right? But I imagine it had to be built in pieces and, and then tested and all that stuff. So how it, I, I'm just, I'm curious about how that process was. Were were you physically in, in the same location for parts of that or or some of it or all of it or how did that work? Um, when we first started, I, we were, I think we just like mapped out virtually what we wanted okay. for the most right. part. Um, and I came up with mostly like the designs of what, what needed to be where and what we should add and what we shouldn't. Um, but then we met for the first time, like a few months after, and we got together and we sat down and just kind of fleshed it all out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Wow. That's that's really really cool. And so th there's a um, app. Uh, is this is an app based uh, platform? Uh, Android, iOS, etc. It's kind of both uh, in the sense where it's actually native to the web. So that's like oh, okay. where the first place we built it for. Okay. But you can download an app directly from our site um, that works across Android and iOS devices, just like a native app would. Okay. And when I say a native application, Mark, you're with me. But for the listeners, uh something in the iOS store right. and why we don't have the Ream app in the iOS store is one, it's actually really easy to download from the Ream website. Like it takes yeah. five seconds, but then second of all, Apple has a lot of fees inside of their app. It's yeah. actually 30% yeah. and yeah. you can't pay inside of the app. And one of the dirty secrets behind why like KU exists and a lot of other big subscription programs are because 
you want to have little friction to reading books inside the app, but yeah. you also want them to pay for it, yet they can't pay for it. Otherwise, authors would take a 30% cut. So go yeah. pay inside of KU on the Amazon website, yeah. then get unlimited books. And in our case, it was like, we want them to support their author directly. So like each time they discover a new author and want to support them, like time to time to pay. And readers yeah. are willing to do that, but you see conversions plummet when you have to send them to a completely different site. Off the app, yeah, on. yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah. And then otherwise it's like authors take a 30% cut, but yeah. like a hit in their re earnings because Apple takes it. And it's like, well, that's not ideal. Yeah. Um, so we luckily, you know, and this is part of being like a new platform that's actually helpful. There's a lot of new web-based technologies that Sean could nerd out on a lot more than me, but he, he's aware of them. He's been utilizing them and building on top of them. And we're lucky that we kind of started at this stage where we can build an app like this because- yeah. Google's rolled out support, Apple's rolled out support for it. And, you know, 10 years ago, the only way to get an app live was in the app store. So um, yeah. times have changed in a good way. It's fantastic. Now, so, I mean, Amelia writes romance and uh, Michael writes sci-fi. Um, I'm assuming there's a plethora of different genres available for readers who are interested to find stuff. I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be at least those two genres, but you've got other stuff available for people to read there. I would say, you know, that this is a great question. I would say that right now we're, we're very genre agnostic. So we, okay. as a platform, want to support authors across all platforms. Right. But for readers, we're not necessarily optimized for reader discovery within the Ream network at the moment because we're so new. Like we launched right. yeah. about 60 days ago. So we're really focused on like direct selling, helping authors connect with their existing fan base, whether that's through free membership or paid membership and deliver them an awesome experience. Discovery is definitely something we want to do down the line. But, and it's actually something that all of our authors want it, of course. Of course. But it's something that a lot of readers are asking for now too. We've seen yeah. a noticeable uptick in that, which is a great sign. But like you said, you chip one thing off at a time. Um, Discovery is definitely, hopefully this time next year, we could yeah. be like, hey, Discovery is something we've moved into and we're helping authors not just monetize on the platform and connect with their readers, but also grow on the platform. That's obviously where, that's where we want to go in the long run. Well, I mean, it, it resolves a problem, I think. It resolved the question with a writer well, like Amelia, who said, uh, you know, I've got I've got that I want to deliver this content. I have people to deliver it to. The tools to deliver them don't exist. So build it. So, you know, all all of the rest of us writers can go, Oh, there's a tool already. We don't need to invent something. So you're leveraging that ability automatically and then you're driving readers to it, saying, Hey, if you wanna support me in a way where I get more and you want access to additional content or you want to read in a particular way here's a great platform that we can go to together and then yeah i do like the idea that later later there may be discoverability because i may bring someone to the platform but i can only write so much and they go well we need someone yeah. else who writes this kind of story uh, how do we find them without leaving because because again keep them keep them engaged in the app and then writers can help each other i imagine I think I think we'll start to see a, a lot of that's already happening with like a cross promotion perspective, like not as we can do so much more, but it's yeah. great to see like just the beginnings of that happening very organically. The writers helping writers really key. And I think one thing that separates us apart just as like a foundational philosophy is that we believe that we're not really another platform. We are instead your platform as an author. We want to give you a place to create your home right. and maybe if we have a thousand different homes here, we can connect them in interesting ways and, right. and help everyone. But because it's your home and you have a direct connection to your readers, a lot of the things that you see in other platforms where it's like, oh, like my readers, I have, I lose my readers, right? Like, where are they? I can't find yeah. them anymore because they've churned to another author. It's like, well, no, you have their emails, right? Um, right? In many cases, you can have their payment information if you set up direct through us, like you're selling on Shopify, which we give them that option. So wow. it, it it's a definitely a it's a new generation of a of a you know a platform and i think it has a very different relationship with writers and that's what i think me and amelia are both excited about long run is like seeing where this relationship goes this this new kind of partnership that we have with authors i like the fact that the platform is also agnostic in terms of the serialized or whole product Right. So yeah. you, as an author, you don't go, oh, but I don't have anything serialized. No, no harm done. You want to sell direct. This is a this is a tool you can use to sell direct uh, for 
single products rather than serialize it, right? So you can kind of come in and, and, and you can do both if you want to, right? Yes, yes. The one thing is uh, that we are uh, not agnostic at the moment about business model, which um, s- subscriptions are a form of selling direct. But I know sometimes when people hear sell direct, they think, oh, like selling a la carte ebooks. And yeah. that's a beautiful thing. But at the moment, that's not what we are focused on because they're really focused on the subscription relationship. Right. Also as well, authors who are monetizing, if you think about both ways, serial fiction, which is a fast growing market, a lot of authors doing well there, they monetize typically through subscriptions. That's a huge, if not the primary revenue stream for a lot of serial fiction authors. So right. they, for those people publishing serially, subscriptions is a great business model for us to focus on. For authors who are publishing in a more full book format, which is awesome, they're probably also publishing on retailers, right? And we, instead of telling them, hey, we're just a new retailer where you can sell more on or sell direct on your own site, because that hasn't really picked up full steam yet. It's This is actually a totally new revenue stream for you, where your fans can support you in addition to what they're already doing, where you can offer different kinds of access to your work. And that to us has been, it's just been more attractive to me as a writer because it's like, I don't want to give up what I'm doing on, you know, if I'm in KU, if I'm wide, wherever I am right now. And I don't want to feel like I'm eating away at that with this direct thing. It's like, actually, no, subscriptions are a separate, but very connected thing. Right. And I think that's why we're focused there for now. And it's been a lot of fun to see authors have success. So just so I understand this correctly, uh, it could be a subscription because it's a serialized story or serialized nonfiction or whatever the serialization is, or it can be a subscription to additional content that is adjacent to the to, to the books. Or book boxes. Uh, Kay Webster is a very big author on the Ream platform who has like, for her, she has like $100 plus price tiers where people are supporting her monthly through like getting book boxes. Um, there's some authors- them- boxes of signed books yeah and like there's goodies in there and she has like a very <laughs> high price tier um where it's like a personalized gift for the reader each month like literally personal i'll drive to your house and read it to you <laughs> there are people who well there's zoom calls that go on to right, yeah. like people will have like fan meetups that are exclusive to paid subscribers at certain That's levels cool. um and then you also see some authors in like who are publishing normally full books, who are writing full books normally, but who are going, eh, I'll just give my fans early access to it in my subscription, right? Well, like, why not? Right. And yeah, they'll yeah. release it three months before on their subscription, the first draft of it. Um, and we see that work for authors across platforms. It doesn't have to just be serial fiction. In short, there's a lot of different options. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So let, let's talk about the growth of subscription as an opportunity for for writers i i mean we we before we started the recording for the interview we talked about the creator economy and 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 that subscription model as a again it brings a new dimension to um the what's available for writers talking about the growth of it i i mean amelia hasn't it surprised you just in the last year since we started like the facebook group the amount of just people who are talking about it now compared to like this time a year ago? Yeah, so many more people are interested in it. And I'm super excited that they want to learn and grow their own subscription because it's finally like that they're taking like power in their own business and they're saying, hey, super fans, I know you love my my work. Come support me directly. Come join my community and subscription and um, we'll have a good time together. So yeah. The market from like a, a numbers perspective, because we we ran a report on this called the top 500 fiction authors and subscriptions uh, for 2022. And we're actually working right now on the 2023 report. We're very early stages of developing it, but we'll roll it out in like a month and a half or two months. And this will just be totally free on our website. But yeah. the, the findings of the report are interesting. For the first year, what we found was that there was roughly just between this list of 500 fiction authors. And it's tough to get it comprehensive. Like there are more fiction authors who are being successful outside of this list. We weren't pretending Mm -hmm. this was the number one comprehensive list, but it's a pretty indicative of it because we did a lot of research. And that group of authors is estimated because we don't have all of their exact earnings, but it's estimated that they're generating over 10 million in revenue. And that was last year, a year annually. And if I add up the long tail of all of it, right? It's pretty clear to me that it's probably, it's closing in probably close to as of 2022, 20 million a year in revenue, which- is on 
comparison with something like Kickstarter. You know, Kickstarter had like the super huge Brandon Sanderson campaign, but if you take that out of their publishing earnings, it's 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 around there, right? So it's kind yeah. of very similar to think about in terms of like it's it's different than Kickstarter, but in terms of the size of the opportunity at this given moment. But I can say early indications this year and watching it grow are that it, it it's grown quite a bit. I, I can't even I can't give a number because I would be making it up, but I've seen tons of authors who have launched in the last year who are now having five or six hundred people who are subscribed to them. So it's like, oh wow, like you know, it's it's there are new authors breaking in like every week. And that's certainly like that's happening. So I'm excited to see where it goes from here and what the growth looks like uh, in terms of the, you know, total dollars that are going to authors, but it's definitely, um, definitely not insignificant. It's, it's a, it's a real opportunity for a lot of people. Oh, that's fantastic. So there is no fee for authors other than there's the finder's fee or the processing fee and stuff right so when the money comes in that's when that's when you guys slice off a little bit to keep the business going right yes yeah and i should also be clear about the report the report was indexing all subscription platforms and that right. was created before rain was even launched so it was um, like market research <laughs> yeah yeah it was i we've outsourced our market researching to like not outsource sorry we we made our market research public because yeah that's i, I think it's good but um Yes, on Ream, how Ream works. And, you know, th this is a very common business model. So it's very familiar to people who are coming from other subscription platforms. We've seen a lot of people migrate from other yeah. places to Ream. Is yes, that 10% plus payment processing fees, which to be clear, those fees are not charged or taken by Ream. They're taken by banks um, and, and credit card companies. And that's typically 2.9% plus 30 cents a transaction, typically. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So you launched, you said just a few months ago, right? Officially uh, launched beyond probably alpha or beta testers and stuff like that. It was a, a couple of months ago and we're we're doing this interview in mid-July right now. So that was like the summer of 2023 was when you first launched? Yes. May 7th. May yeah. 7th. Now you've already mentioned a couple pretty cool examples of what authors are doing, but are there are there authors who have used or leveraged the platform or the tool, I should say, in a way that's surprised you? You know, I've seen a few surprising things. So one is that I, I've seen authors blend fiction and nonfiction in a very interesting way. And I'll give an example of an author on Ream doing this. But I think her model is something that like other fiction authors could consider, which is that yeah. uh, her name's Bianca Reeves and she creates like magical fantasy books, but she also, a lot of her books are focused like, and they're fiction books. Let me be very clear about that. Um, they're focused on themes of wellness, themes of, you know, men mental health. And she actually has basically like a coaching wellness um, holistic, like soul, like it, it's spiritual. Like you'd sign up almost to get like spiritual wellness coaching at yeah. like her highest tier. Um, and it's group coaching that she's doing with like four or five of the readers. And it's a pretty high ticket tier. So it's something that I think is interesting. And I've seen this again with um, another author in um, another interesting model I've seen is authors immersing their readers where it's like, we're going to, come up with a book club on Ream where they've had their backlit. They might have 50 books out. Um, right. And an example of an author doing this who had an incredible launch uh, on Ream, she's already up like 40 members. Uh, and her name is uh, Kitty, um, forgetting her last name, but I will get that to you. I'll look it up when mm -hmm. I mute myself, but <laughs> sure. Yeah, her name, first name is Kitty. I, I love her. Uh, she is doing a monthly book club because she has like 40 books out. So she's taking a book from her backlist and doing uh, basically an event where like there'll be a post in the QD on Ream where you can make comments and talk. Readers will be able to interact with the book itself on Ream. And each month she's taking one book from her backlist, having her readers vote on it. And it's basically like a mini subscription to Kitty. And wow. I think it's genius. It's a great way to repurpose her backlist and give a great experience to fans who are one don't know about her backlist and want to go into her backlist. That's a huge problem for authors. Like this gives you a great way to market your backlist. It's like, Hey, this is the book club of the month next month. Want to sign up and keep going to my backlist. And then in the other perspective for fans who've already read her books, 
what a cool experience to reread it. They get to get comments from the author. They get to get comments and see what the other readers are experiencing. And then she's making a post in the community where it's like a whole question and answer session specifically about that book. I mean, those are just two examples, but I find both of them cool in different ways. Are there writers leveraging the way that, you know, and I'm sure Amelia are familiar with the way that this worked in Wattpad is when you engage in the text, interacting with people, that can really help um, drive more people to it, right? Because we have to remember as writers, we forget about this. Readers don't often have access to writers. They buy books, they read books, they don't have access to them. This gives the reader direct access, whether it's engaging in the text, engaging in, you know, some of the examples that you said, the the live chats, the the whatever. Is that is that something that people the more successful people tend to tend to be doing then? I, I would say so. Um, but also I think a lot of um authors are starting to utilize um within their chapters like something called author notes or creator notes, where at the end of the chapter, um, especially if you're doing serial fiction, right? Like the author asks the readers, like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think is gonna happen next? And at least I found that's a really great way to engage the readers to start commenting like to you, but then also commenting and talking to each other. Yeah. Um, and so we've seen uh, quite a few people start doing those author notes, which has, which have been successful. So I love that. I mean, I, I've ever since I started with fiction, I always put author notes at the back of my fiction, the end mm -hmm. of the, you know, no, notes about the stories or notes about the writing of the novel or whatever, but the idea of doing it on a chapter by chapter basis not live, but you know what I mean? As it's rolling out can, can really impact uh, that. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. I I have so much fun doing it because then I can see everyone's comments to, to my question. And if I, I feel like for the most part, um, if I didn't write that question, they wouldn't tell me their thoughts on the chapter. So it really yeah. gets people going about <laughs> um, what's happening. So I uh, I had this experience years ago, uh, a novel that was eventually traditionally published. The first uh, third of that novel was rolled out, serialized on a blog back in the early, early day, the dark ages of blogging. And I was making the story up as I went along and responding to comments and actually mm -hmm. changing the story to give them more of what they wanted. Is that something that you're leveraging? Or I know you've probably leveraged that in Wattpad too. That's exactly what I do. <laughs> I <laughs> I write live and I, I usually don't have outlines when I write. So they comment and sometimes they'll guess my like my um big thing that was gonna happen in the story. And I'm like, all right, well, I can't use that now. I have to create something that's like crazy. <laughs> change it. So you had an yeah. idea of this is gonna happen sometime in yeah. the future, and then they guess it and you're like, Nope, that's out of the yeah, question. <laughs> that was a red herring I put in there for you. <laughs> I yeah. love that. Oh, well, that's fantastic. So, so again, so you're not an outliner. Uh, you you have an idea, you have a concept, maybe you know roughly if it's romance, you you know there has to be a happy ending, but <laughs> how do they get there is kind of the fun of the journey, right? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, wow. Okay, wow, this is so cool. I can't wait to go check this out, maybe maybe get back into that realm. Uh, or even even again, just for for listeners who are thinking about this, maybe maybe serialized fiction is not your forte, but this is a way you can engage with your readers in a in a really robust and and dynamic way. As we're getting close uh, to wrapping up, uh, I'd love to hear uh, the answer to this question. I always worry about when writers get involved in helping other writers and building tools and running platforms and and all that stuff you guys still doing your own writing i am yeah. um it, it definitely i i really enjoy doing both and i i feel on especially with having ream it's much easier for me to engage with my readers and my um, community that i've made so it's become a lot easier so yeah, for me, that is a definite yes. Okay. And Michael? My first answer, I'll say, I found the name of the author, Kitty Thomas. I was Thank getting you. her real name and her pen name. Uh, I didn't want to say her real name. So yeah, of Kitty course, you have to protect the innocent. <laughs> yes. I'm like, I'm getting something messed up in my mind. And there we go. For me personally, I'm not writing at the moment. Um, I'm actually in college. So I have one year left of college. And I feel like 
when I finish college, you can only do so many things at once. Ream and college for now is definitely my my maximum. Uh, but when I graduate college, I definitely would love to get back into fiction, but I've been writing a, a lot of nonfiction focused on distilling a lot of these things I'm interested in. So I'm, I'm still creating and still writing, but uh, of course I, I miss um, creating like entertainment really, because uh, nonfiction is entertaining, but not, you know, it's, it's a little bit different and I, I, I miss it, but it's been very fun in, in this role too. And it, honestly, I want to do this for very, very, very long time. I fell in love with both. Awesome. All right. So any words of advice from each of you for other writers, maybe beginning writers or writers who have never, who's never done this, done this kind of engagement or never written serialized fiction, any thoughts or words of advice for them? Um, I would say value yourself and your work, price yourself at a, a, a good price, price your work at what you think it's worth and probably a few more dollars than that. <laughs> And then also engage with your community because I I see a lot of um, readers just feeling like they're another dollar to a few off like some authors, but yeah. readers are people and they want to be treated like people. And um, it's really awesome to be able to have a community of fans and readers who want to be there for you as a person and a writer. So, I mean, to just add on to that because all that advice is beautiful. Amelia says this a lot and I love it, you know, under promise, over deliver. And one big thing to know is just you're not, you're not KU. You might be thinking, oh, well, if someone's supporting me at $5 a month, that's half of a KU membership. And there's, there's a bazillion books now in KU. Like, you know, how am I going to compete with that? I better be writing, you know, a book a month, at, you know, at least however much I physically can do just to keep up for that. And it, in reality, one, you're not KU, that it's a totally different thing. Readers want to be immersed in your roles to get the early access to what you're doing, to get the special behind the scenes and to support you because they really do value your work, right? So that's one thing. And the second thing is that I've seen this a lot with authors who are like producing so much that there's too much for readers to keep up with. I've seen authors launch a subscription with 10 different benefits, right? The early access, the bonus content, the, the exclusive newsletter, the exclusive cover reel. And I, I like get through it and I'm like, I... First of all, I'm overwhelmed just reading this for you, but then also as a reader, I'm a little overwhelmed because I'm like, well, why am I really here? Because I probably don't want all of this. And it leads me to a great quote from a book called Retention Point. And the quote is this, value is like water. Too little of it and you're going to you're gonna dehydrate. That's not going to be good. But also too much of it and you're going to drown. So not only should you think about pricing, but thinking about what you're offering, you never should drown yourself or your readers. And obviously I don't need to tell people this, but you don't want to dehydrate yourself either. Fill up your creative well and do write something. Your readers do want some stories, but there's a, there's a very much a balance to that. Awesome. All right. So just, just to reiterate, uh, reamstories.com is where people can check this out. I got that the platform. Right. Yeah. And if they're, if they want to check out our community, because it's a big commitment to join a new platform, especially like, yeah, you, you look at Ream, it's an awesome, awesome piece of software, but you might want to know how to use it. We developed a lot of free resources at okay. subscriptionsforauthors.com. And if you sign up for our mailing list, or actually if you search up on any ebook retailer, we are wide, wide, wide for the win here. You can look up subscriptions for authors book and it's totally free. And you can actually find a free version of the audiobook on YouTube and any podcast outlet. Audible made me charge a price for it. So do not buy the audiobook on Audible. Go, go to YouTube. And you can check it out there. Oh my God. Okay. And now where can people find out more about you guys as writers? Um, for me, it's just ameliarose.com. For me, it's not that simple. It's M Evans I N K E D dot com. <laughs> Fine. That's all cool. I'll have links to all those resources in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. Amelia, Michael, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. This is a lot of fun. Thank you for having us on. So a lot can change in, in just two minutes. Um, I was just talking about, you know, being uh, overwhelmed and frustrated with all the work that I had piled up uh, that I'd done to myself, admittedly. And then Liz comes home from work and, and she did an after work meeting with some friends and um, she brought a little surprise for me, a pizza. Uh, delicious, delicious uh, thick crust um, pizza, almost deep dish, co combination between um, 
the crust and deep dish from graffiti market in kitchener ontario it was a dill pickle kind of hot spicy oh just absolutely delicious it was just a nice little small slice and uh, two things um seeing the smile on liz's face seeing her and and then of course the um those are kind of combined right when i see her and then the pizza and just that little uh, gesture of loveliness and wonderfulness and the fact that i was i was sitting here and i was, I was getting hungry because <laughs> i had had really uh, small lunch early early on um because i was doing a, a draft to digital live uh, this afternoon um we just around sort of lunch hour and then thought I was really I should stop doing this recording I should go have something to eat but I said no I want to get the recording done and and in that hangriness that I had I was probably feeling more overwhelmed than I should have and I let it all out into this microphone I'm so sorry but then one little beautiful gesture can make a difference so I'm reflecting on that first I'm reflecting on the one little thing that you can do can really make a dramatic and important and positive difference in someone else's life um and so there, there's there's my there's my uh, liz smile slash pizza reflection two of my favorite things in the world <laughs> so um all right but the reflections on the conversation that you just listened to and just and just to break down the mechanics the way i do this is i will edit i will uh, listen to the interview which is you know this was done i think back in june sometime listen to the interview I will edit the interview together. I'll make my notes on what I'm going to reflect on. Then I'll go back, record the introduction, and then I put in the bumpers and stuff. Then I come back and do the reflection just to give you an idea of the weird time, um, the time warp continuum that's going on as I do this. So uh, here are the actual reflections on the conversation you just listened to. The first one, the first one is, uh, I liked when Amelia uh, talked about taking the best of multiple platforms and experiences, you know, like the Wattpad experience and this experience, etc., and merging them to create something that was going to optimize the experience. So again, there's this wonderful creativity in saying, "I like this about this, and that about that, and this about the other thing." We're going to put them all together, and we're going to we're going to create a completely new environment. So there's there's huge value in that. Think about that as a value in creating a platform for writers and readers. But think about that in terms of the things that you do in your own writer career are there ways you can do that so that was the first thing i wanted to reflect on and ask ask you to reflect on that yourself the the second way was they created this platform and and i loved hearing about the creative ways that authors have used the platform you know it, it was built as a fiction platform but they're they're using it for other bonus content and stuff like that so that was just really great like uh, you know the author notes and stuff which they got me excited about because you know, I, I always do author notes even at the end of my my novels my you know the canadian werewolf novels always have an author's note at the end and, and i think initially the author's note was hey this was meant to be a short story and ended up becoming a novel because my dear friend sean costello said what happens next <laughs> and he wouldn't stop you know so I, I i like to do that but it would be really cool to have author notes all the way through because uh, like oh this chapter was inspired by this thing or this element or i saw this or this happened to me or whatever it was i love that some point in time when i'm feeling less overwhelmed i'm probably gonna see if i can go and check out this platform and, and maybe build some of that in for some of my some of my uh works uh and again it's just uh, I'll, I'll have to have some downtime in order to play with it but i'm, I'm really excited about playing with it. I am putting it on a back burner because I've already got too many things on. My stove is way too small. Or actually the back burner of my stove is really, really big. But all the other pots are <laughs> are in the process of cooking. And then and then the third thing, the last thing I wanted to, uh, I guess the fourth thing when you think about my previous reflection, but the third thing about the interview, the reflection, was, was Emily's advice. And my apologies, I just called her Emily. It was Amelia's advice. Sorry, Amelia, um, people. And they want to be treated like people, not just not just people who are going to open up their wallets and give you something. And and in our thirst, in our quest, in our desire to make a living as a writer, we can sometimes forget that. Now, I, I just did, and, and, and this is this is top of mind because just a few hours ago, 
I did a live uh, draft digital self-publishing insiders live with Daniel Wilcox of Activated Authors. And we have to bring bring Dan on to. Uh, to, actually, I am going to be bringing Dan on in the future to do something really cool to improve my writer business, and I'm going to do it right in front of you guys. You're going to see it. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to expose myself and show you the benefit of of why I would hire someone like Dan to help me with my website. I like doing that sort of thing. I like showing you the process and the behind the scenes, only because we often don't get a chance to see the behind the scenes. We only get to see the finished project uh, or product, and we think... Oh, that, that person must be perfect. I want you to make sure that you're seeing that. So again, back to authenticity and why I'm showing you those those things. And and I do it not to bore you or put you to sleep. I do it to remind you that though I have this persona, I have this brand as a person who's out there and helping other authors and, and writing and, and doing all the things, right? Engaging in, in, in multiple aspects that it's not always easy and and I and I run into and I run into walls just like you do, and and I get that feeling of defeat, just like you do, and I get exhausted, just like you do, and and I'm and I'm sharing that so you can see the warts and the bruises and the scars, and not just that person that maybe shares stuff on social media and you go, oh, dude, he does so much, and uh, he's always smiling. I want you to understand that that's always a persona, right? We only we see the authors who are hugely successful in doing these great things. We don't always get to see behind the scenes and the hard work and the frustration and the whatever it is that gets in the way. Because we fail to recognize that it looks good when everything's done, but you know this about your writing, your manuscripts, all the process, the, the pu- publishing process, all of those things are challenging and difficult. And we forget when we look at other people and go, wow, look at how happy they are. Look at the thing. And they published a book and they did this and they're doing well. We forget all of those hard things that they had to do too because we see our own hard things, but we see their success and we don't see the other. That's I'm going to bring that back to readers is remembering the value of what a platform like Reem can do is it's the value of you interacting and engaging and connecting with the readers that they're real people just like you they have ups and downs and good days and bad days and that this is a platform that is built to allow you different ways to interact in a dynamic way you as a real author can interact with real people And that's a really critical thing for us to remember, particularly, as I said, we want to build our careers. We want to get our stuff out there. We want people to love the stuff that we're writing. And I think it's valuable, very critical, very important to engage and be authentic and um, interact with that audience that you're building because they're not just an audience. They're part of your community. They're part of a very, very important community so again uh loved having michael and amelia and did i say emily again did i mess that up and my my apologies amelia i really really um there's no excuse for me (laughs) i just make mistakes but i want to thank amelia and michael for coming on the podcast but also for taking the time to do uh to create like this brilliant platform that i'm really looking forward to check out and and i'm curious about you uh, if, if you're check, gonna check it out and maybe what ideas or reflections you have uh about this uh, wonderful opportunity that, that again combines so many of the best of the best of these different platforms but that's it for this episode that's it for my rambling reflections and um i will be back next week as always. So until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie LeFay wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.